Hello, and welcome to Realm 2. Episode 21, The Battle of Cosentia. We have Lucius Julius Libo of Roma, commanding Legio 2, being reinforced by the Garrison Army and Legio 6, totaling about 7,500 men defending Cosentia from Carthage. Mago has 3,239 men, and Chinebo has 3,808 men. So it is about 7,500 Romans versus 8,000 Carthaginians, including a unit of elephants in the reinforcing army. So we will have to take care in dealing with that. But for now, let's start the battle. Now, I'm going to assume this layout is going to be the same as the first battle of Cosentia that I fought. I guess you can call this the second battle of Cosentia. But we're going to adopt a much more defensive posture. I'm going to leave Legio 2 in and around the fort as a purely defensive formation against the reinforcing army. I'm going to use my reinforcing armies, right, Legio 6 and the garrison, to deal with Carthage's main army in a flanking maneuver. So the goal is going to be turtle around the fort with Legio 2 and then use Legio 6 and the garrison army as a attacking force. That should minimize casualties in Legio 2, since they're adopting a more defensive posture, and make it so that, you know, as I deal with Carthage's main force with my reinforcing army, I can deal with Carthage's reinforcing force with my more elite units, because that reinforcing army on Carthage's part is much, much more dangerous. Alright, so we're going to take a unit of Principes, put them in a defensive formation, and we're going to just block our back exits here. If you look at the fort, I didn't explain it too well last time, but it has a front entrance, it has a rear entrance, and it has a side entrance. We are literally just going to defend this back entrance with two units of Principes in a very tight defensive formation. We're going to hope the enemy doesn't come in the back door, but if they do, we are going to be ready. We're going to take our cavalry and move them out because we want them on the outside. Obviously, they want to be our mobile force there. And then we're going to move our Triarii out as well. And I think what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of try to intermix our units and see how far our Triarii line can get in the Phalanx formation. can get pretty far, but not as far as I need it to be. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to put our Triarii right here in front of our, our gate. Now there's some boulders next to the fort. I'm going to kind of use these boulders as a, you know, kind of a marker to prevent the enemy from getting any closer. So we're going to go from the walls in front of our eastern flank to the boulder. And we're going to take three units of Principes and put them on the opposite side of the walls to the boulder. And we're also going to put them in a defensive formation. Defensive formations make it so the units are a lot more compact, but at the same time, you know, because they're compact, they're harder to get through. And then it looks like there's a gap here between the boulder and my fort. So we're going to put a unit of Triarii right there just in case the enemy gets any ideas about trying to you know, exploit this small gap between, you know, the boulder and my units. I don't think they will, but in case they do, we have a unit of Triarii in place ready to defend. And that handles our rear entrance and our left flank entrance, which leaves us with one, two, three, four, five, six Principe units that we're going to just station out front here. Now, there are once again are rocks and stuff in the way, so we're going to have to do our best here, but... Right now I'm going to put one unit of Principes on the flank there. And then we're going to put another unit of Principes right in front of them. And we're going to extend our lines that way. I don't want them to be the longest of lines. I want them to be defensive. So that's what we're going to take our deployables here. There's some barricades. And we're going to actually barricade my flank here. Just because I think that's the safer bet. We can barricade the flanks. And this way, if the enemy does come in from the sides, they're going to have to fight through those barricades, which is going to be very difficult. And we're going to put the caltrops down in front of our infantry on the left flank. 
just in case the horsemen decide they want to charge me. And we'll put some pike or spike traps down in front of our main entrance. And that'll be it. I think our General. forces are in formation and ready. We're going to go ahead and start the battle here and uh, get to it. So here we go. As expected, the main Carthaginian force is directly in front of me. I can't see the reinforcements anywhere, and my reinforcing army is on the way in right now. Like I said, we're not going to really do much. This reinforcing army is just going to go straight ahead, and it's going to get right into combat as soon as it can. I'm going to take our general from the reinforcing army and bring him to where the rest of my cavalry is. And we're going to try to get these reinforcements, just get them there immediately. So the enemy cavalry is closing in on my front line, but that's okay. I'm more worried with my reinforcing armies and getting them in position because I have a pretty good defensive wall set up. One of here. our units has used all its ammunition. It looks like their cavalry is going to play with my cavalry though, so we're going to indulge them. And we're going to charge them right out. Our is under attack. We can take this enemy cavalry off the board. I'm all for it. And then the enemy cavalry tried to take out my Triarii. Didn't work too well. I don't know what the enemy cavalry is doing, but they just charged a bunch of spearmen and swordsmen. Um, swordsmen, not swordsmen, yeah, horsemen, but... Did not work out for their benefit at all. We're also going to split my cavalry up into actually two forces here. I'm going to have one general and two equites in one, and one general and two equites in the other. And we're going to split these guys up for now. I don't want to leave all my cavalry on one side. I know that the enemy is going to be coming in. I can see them coming in now. So I want to have a unit of cavalry near my rear entrance to act as a support. Like I said, I only need these three cavalry here for now. I think that'll be... That'll be plenty. And we're actually going to move our two Principes and our Triaria out from that defensive position. Because we have three Slingers coming in, and we have our three Cavalry units in support. So we should be plenty good to go. The enemy is just kind of bunching up, which is good. But... why they're bunching up. But it's good for me, like I said. So an enemy cavalry unit here got stuck on my Principes. It's a ranged cavalry unit, so I'm not sure what exactly they were doing, but like I said, we are having our reinforcing army just sweep in while our main armies just hold. And it looks to be working very well. I have no desire to inflict casualties with my main legion right like you too they're purely for defensive purposes as the uh supporting army right my reinforcing army does most of the work we're gonna have our uh supporting army start to uh move in All the enemy horsemen from the initial army are off the board, but the enemy reinforcing horsemen are here, and they are here in strength. So I am unsure where they are going to go. One of our units has used all its ammunition. We are going to get our slingers actually in the base, though. They'll be better defended behind the walls. And then we are going to get this uh, reinforcing army down to work because the enemy cavalry. They charged, remember I put all those barricades up? They just charged them. So those barricades are doing exactly what I wanted to, and that's just slowing the enemy cavalry down, allowing me to get my units in position, which is crucial. Getting my units in position is huge. Like I have my slingers in position now. The enemy general now. is dead. The enemy general's even dead, even better. And it looks like the enemy is not attacking part of my left flank. So we're gonna pull them out of defensive formation. We're just going to get moving. If we can flank, that would be even better. Alright. Time to throw these Italian citizens away. I got 
two units of them here, and we're just gonna have them charge in. It looks like the enemy elephants are stuck on the other side of those barricades, oh, too. They're about to break through, though, so we're gonna use our creep of pace there. We also have an enemy unit of Scutari that broke through, so we're gonna have a unit of, uh, Swordsman, or Swordsman, of unit of Creep of Pace, peel off and help out. There's a whole bunch of enemy ranged units enclosing on us, so we're gonna just take that cavalry force we had in the rear and start harassing the enemy ranged units because why not, right? Like, that's what cavalry does. They chase the enemy down general is dead. enemy ranged units. And there you go, we have another dead enemy general, so that's very good. The elephants have made their way into my Prinkapay formation, though, so little troublesome there, but you know what? I think it's going to be okay because we are in really good shape. One of our units has used all its ammunition on our left flank. Like I said, the enemy cavalry just ran out way ahead of everybody for some reason. And yeah, that's, that's not good to just run out in front of everybody. Although my, my unit of uh, the men are wavering. cavalry just got caught off guard, so we're going to redeploy our units here. Those Triari that were holding the line, we're going to have them head out here, and they're going to encircle the main army, while those units six units are going to bail out my cavalry that just got cut off. We're going to go ahead and actually everything we can here to inspire the enemy, or inspire us, and uh, rally, or war cry the enemy. So we just sent all our inspires and rallies, and uh, we're going to see how it works out. We're going to have those two Triara units kind of flank the uh, enemy elephants and see if we can't get those elephants caught off guard. One of our units has used all its ammunition. Looking good though, looking good. We are in formation still. Our lines are all holding. We have a couple enemy units just milling about, so we're gonna go ahead. Oop, enemy elephants are out near my cavalry. I'm gonna get them away. So I don't know how those enemy elephants broke out, but they did. We're just gonna close in though on those elephants. I don't want any element elements, any elephant reinforcements. And then we have a mass route over here, so I'm gonna start actually diverting cavalry to hunt down the enemy. Because once again, I do not want to deal with any reinforcements. We want to capture as many Carthaginians as we can. In a surprise turn of events though, the Carthaginians are heavily outnumbering my left flank here on that new line that I formed up, so we're gonna redeploy this line here as we try to hold. Hopefully we will be able to successfully hold, but we do not know. And let's get a couple more units redeployed here to help us out. We also have that cavalry unit that we're going to have engaged and we're going to pull our general. Our general kind of got surrounded here because I took away his cavalry, his cavalry friends. Still looking good though. The enemy main army is pretty much in full retreat, which is how we like it. And, uh, my walls. Oh, they just knocked the wall down. That's fine. There's no one there that even matters. It's a cavalry charge you hear incoming. Lots of enemies running away. I really need to chase them down. The battle is turning in our favor. You hear that? The battle is turning in our favor. They know that the bat has been in our favor. 
Come on, cavalry, do your thing. Lots of enemies routing right now that I'm chasing down. I don't have to fight them again. Left side here, we caused some more units to route, so that's a good thing. Like I said, it, there's a lot of small skirmishes taking place right now. And those small skirmishes are like, you know, one or two of my units versus one or two of their units. Nothing too crazy. Still, things do look good. The uh, main Carthaginian army is fully en route, and I am just chasing down the enemies, and the backup army is, or the reinforcing army is also routing pretty heavily. And I recall some cavalry here, like I said, we want to chase these enemies down. I don't want reinforces, like these, these forces to get away. I want them to be captured, and no longer people that can oppose me, because... You know, manpower is right now going to be the biggest issue going forward. Like I said, the Carthaginians are going to throw wave after wave of people at me, and I don't know, I'm going to need to deal with them. And the way I'm going to deal with them is, like I said, inflicting the max amount of damage, but I have to be smart about it because I can only reinforce for so long before Quocenti is out of manpower, and then I'm going to be stuck, right? I'm going to be having to go really far, all the way back to Rome, in order to replenish my forces. You know, maybe Terrace, right? Maybe even Beneventum, but that should be like an emergency only that we replenish from there. For the most part, you know, because you never know. Like, even right now, I was rushing Legio 3 down here because I just don't have the units. I only have one full-time Legion here, Legio 2. Yes, Legio 3 and Legio 4 are on the way, but, you know, they're going to take time to get there. And the time it takes to get there, Legio 2 needs to pull. So, like I said, lots of talking. I think we did do a good job here of causing a mass route. We definitely inflicted a lot more damage than they did. And that was because, like I said, we took up that strictly defensive posture. That strictly defensive posture really made it a lot easier on us. Like I said, I'm, I'm always going to argue that being on the defense is a lot easier, especially when we have a fort here. We can take advantage of the walls, we can take advantage of the deployables, and we can take advantage of the towers that help us. The biggest thing in Cosentia is there are no towers in that city. It is not a walled city, so I guess it's not even a city. I call it a town. So because it's a town, right, no, no towers to help us. No towers to help us means no additional casualties coming out of nowhere. And, you know, that's an issue. Not a huge issue, but it is an issue nonetheless. Uh, like I said, main army is pretty much gone. The main enemy Carthaginian army, I'm still just chasing enemy forces down. And they only have two, three, four, five, six enemy forces here left. And once I bring in these units here, surround them they should be pretty well destroyed just you know like i said we had you know probably a dozen of those micro battles you know take place we didn't have a firm battle line it was just like one on one right or two on two or two on one or one on two like kind of like in uh you know the romans had each unit right each fighting unit was a hundred men or so you know that's what they had and that's kind of what happened they just kind of broke into individual battles between individual units Kind of cool how that happens. That'll be something we cover in our spotlight today, actually. Our spotlight is going to be on the Roman army and reforms, the Regal Era. So the Regal Era is the king's period, well, it was the Roman kingdom. And now we're going to have a, a fun time discussing about the Roman army in its inception, what it was like when it first began. I mean, we won't even reach the, uh, the Camillan or the Polybian era just yet. We are just covering Rome while it was under the kings, and uh, go from there. These units on the left are taking a little bit longer to route than I like, and that's because we just don't have the units nearby, and a lot of them are either phalanx units or spearmen units, so it's risky to have our cavalry kind of get in there and do much of anything. 
they're all now starting to waver. I assume we're going to have a mass route here in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Victory is yours. You can choose either to end the battle now or continue playing and run down the routed enemy. Well, you know what we're going to do. We're going to run down the routed enemy. No survivors. Well, I guess these are people who will all be survivors because you know, they'll end up captured and not killed. That also does bring up another good concern. With so many slaves in the uh, Republic already, what do we want to do? And I still think the right action is going to be to enslave them. You know, we might be able to release them. I think releasing them, if I recall, gives us the most money in return. But I don't like that because I don't know what those units do. Do they come back to fight? Also, I'm going to speed this up to times three speed. Do they come back and fight me later, right? Like, if I release these captured men, probably going to be around 2,000 captured men, do they just instantly rejoin those Carthaginian armies? Do they go back to Carthage and just join their manpower pool? I don't know what happens. And like I said, I do not want to have to fight these men again immediately if they just return. Like, if I just, okay, I captured, let's say, 400 sacred band hoplites, I'm just going to release you, and then 400 sacred band hop lights just rejoin the Carthaginian armies that are right on the peninsula. I don't want that. I, I already beat them once, and like I said, killing them, while awful, it removes them from the board, but it doesn't give me the most money, and if you recall, we were only making 33.49 denarii next turn, so we're going to need the money, either to build buildings or to recruit more troops, probably to prop up our economy to build more buildings, so it's going to be it pretty much chase down all the enemies, so we're going to go ahead and quit the battle. Decisive victory. Ooh, and we even got an achievement. Look to the defenses. Uh, there can be no doubt this is a great victory. The enemy are dead or running for their lives. So let us save the replay. This is going to be battle six. We fought Carthage. If I can spell right, Carthage. We fought at Cosenti again. It was 269. BCE, and we were on the defense. So like I said, defensive battles, I always enjoy them more, especially when I have a fort that I can play around. We'll give you the after actions report after this, but this looks like this is massive. So general, 246 kills, equites, 383, 266, 381, 431, like they all gained a bunch of experience. We have a couple Prince Capet units, 303, 223, 271 kills, and then a couple that are lower, 95, 86, 61. So you can see those 61 and 86 kills, they probably encountered the enemy elephants, but overall, a, a resounding victory. You know, the enemy there, we're taking a look. We didn't hunt down everybody. You know, they're going to have some units left over, but that main army is just obliterated. And, yeah. Let's go over our... Uh, action report here so before we get into it legio 2 not a single unit is in the red every single unit is either in the green or yellow and that's because like i said they adopted that purely defensive stance they were not there to do anything but play defense like even our cavalry 97 men 97 men 100 men 94 men that's huge that is that is huge and just about every unit gained an experience uh, even our garrison army, a couple of units gained experience, and the only people that really took damage was our Italian citizens, right? And that's what you'd expect. Lucius Scipio, same thing, very few casualties, so that's really, really good. On the enemy's end here, in uh, what would be Melkart's Justice, we killed the enemy leader, so the enemy commander is dead, and he's only got two remaining units. And then in the Ambassadors of Atlas, right, enemy general is dead. And they only have three remaining units. Sadly, those elephants did get away, but overall, resounding success. So, here we go. Decisive victory. Carthage deployed 7,047 men. They lost 6,353. They have 694 remaining. 1,060 kills on their part, and zero enemy captured. So, I guess I did my math very bad. Instead of being 7,500 versus 8,000 Carthaginians, it was 6,500 versus 7,000 Carthaginians, so my bad on the math. You know, not a big fan of math, so it is what it is. Apologies. But there you have the correct numbers. Rome deployed 6,444 men. We lost 1,111. 
We have 5,333 remaining, and we got 4,840 kills with 1,328 men captured. And with those 1,328 captured, we are going to enslave those captives. That will generate 2,626 wealth. So, enormous victory for Rome there. To follow up, we have some Carthaginian fleet movement. They sailed a pretty heavy fleet and a lighter fleet up, and they attacked those Carthaginian pirates. They sailed off towards Epirus, and then that Carthaginian fleet moved up, and it looked like it attacked Epirus. If you recall, Epirus and Carthage are still at war. I don't like the fact that they're approaching the Mare Adriaticum, but I guess it is nice that we have some Carthaginian pressure on Epirus. So I'll have to see what I want to do there. Maybe a Pyros will put to sea. Maybe they'll get destroyed. I wouldn't be opposed to it, but I think I'm going to be very reserved in my fleets. I'm going to keep my fleets deeper in my territory so they can't be attacked. And just, you know, build them up. Right? That's what I've been doing, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. Build up the fleets until I can get to a 20 stack. And then I can basically, with one 20 stack, take out a Carthaginian navy with ease, as long as it stays, you know, at around a 14 stack. Uh, you'll see when we finally do get to a ship battle that it's very difficult for me to control all the ships individually and then sometimes they get boarded and it's then it's a race against time to sink the enemy ship before they take out my marines but you know it is what it is the ship combat's a little clunky but at least we have it you know in the initial realm it was just auto resolve every ship battle and it wasn't even an accurate auto resolve just like in this game none of the auto resolves are accurate I would never auto-resolve in Divide et Impera, but overall I am astoundingly happy that they attacked me and that I did such a good job. Oh, the Venetians marched in and took Segastica too, so I think the Nori are now extinct. We'll find out here in a minute. So, first off, I would like to welcome you to turn 39. It is now a beautiful, glorious summer of 269 BCE. So that battle we fought was in the spring. It's a very nice battle. We also have a pop-up here, right? The need for cavalry. Despite your undoubted military might, some have drawn attention to the fact that your cavalry lacks strength and numbers. So we want to rally the horsemen. That will reduce the cost of recruiting cavalry by 25%, or cavalry training, plus two experience ranks for cavalry recruits all provinces. We'll probably just rally the horsemen. Experience isn't huge. I'd rather get cheaper horsemen. And then returned from the mission, Arya Calvino. Trade agreement dissolved, Syracuse. I did not see that. So it looks like Syracuse has been destroyed. I guess in my exhilaration, I missed that. So before we get into the campaign map and see what transpired, let's go ahead and look at our event messages here. We got quite a few of them. So we'll kind of refocus the map here up towards Rome, get a good look at our beautiful Republic and see Faction destroyed the Arabishi. So that was that faction up to the north. They were up here. I don't know who controls them now. It says the Lugas control them. So we're at war with the Lugos and so is the Venetian. But that is where the Arabashi were. They were up there in North Pannonia. Another faction has also been destroyed, the Nori. So this faction has been destroyed and the people scatter to the wind. So our war with the Nori is now over. We are at war with many people, but with the successful capture of Segastica over here by the Venetians, the Nori have been removed from the board. So that is one less foe to contend with, and we even got the city of Iotter out of it. Household expands Lucius Julius Libo. He got a diligent centurion. Oh, and uh, throw him to the floor, sir. Plus two public order per turn in the local province. Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Asina, this is a good one, extra barley rations. If men disobey, this is the least of their rewards. One food in the local province, minus 4% upkeep for all land units, and plus 4% morale for all battles. Extra barley rations are by far my favorite household retainer piece. Lucius Julius Lipo also got a master smith, that is plus 4% weapon damage inflicted by all army units. And then lastly, Medulinus Navis Fullo, the Admiral, got a Dread Cultist. Uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this, but... Feningulae Maguanath, Cthulhu Rileo Wilganaga Fgatham. 
pretty interesting. I did see Cthulhu there, so that's kind of cool. I've never even seen that one before. Uh, unseasonal condition, a warm summer in Illyricum, so that'll help public order. And then faction destroyed, Sara Husai. And uh, that's it. Shipwrights report. We recruited three more assault biremes in class assist one. So, that handled our event messages. I really do want to do the campaign map, but I'm going to stick to the format. So, we're going to go ahead and look at our event messages here. Oh, no, just kidding. Event messages are done. We're going to check out our spy. So, Olpia Sevra is where Messina would be, right? That is the northeast tip of Sicily. However, with Syracuse now dead, we do not have vision at all. So, we're going to actually move her closer towards the city of Syracuse. And we're going to put her in a established intelligence network position here. And we're just going to have her sit on Sicily. So, right now she can see a good portion of Sicily. She has vision on Syracusae and Agragas, both in Carthaginian control, and when we put her in that established network stance, she gained view of Panormos. So most of Sicily, I think we can see. We will review what we see there later. Then we're going to go ahead and take Mamemia and Hanobarba here. She is on Corsica, just north of Alalia, and we're going to have her also establish an intelligence network. So far, no Carthaginian fleets nearby. I'm going to double check our governors here, make sure they haven't left the administration stance. I know I do this every turn, but sometimes they pop out of that stance and I don't notice. So they're still administrating. I don't think our veterans leveled up. They don't gain experience. No, but they will level up next turn. So one veteran is 90 out of 96, and the other veteran is also 90 out of 96. So they don't gain experience from battles, but they do gain experience by being in the armies. Now, I do want to go to the faction tab. If you do recall, we decided to kick the Scythian slaves that the patrician had outside of the city. And I'm not sure what that's going to do to the patricians. So right now our risk of civil war is at 29%. It's uh, very, very high. And that is mainly because the Gens Papiria here is at a negative 25 loyalty. So we're going to see what we can do here. We do have 6,362 denarii in the treasury. I was hoping we would be able to use that for other stuff, but at a 29% risk of civil war, we gotta, we gotta take action. So, Lucius Papyrus Cursor, nothing we can do there. We can take Sertoria Corva and Salonia Cornuta out on missions. Now, Sertoria Corva is at the highest rank, which is Matron. So she's as loyal as she's gonna get. So, not much we can do there. I am gonna promote, or I'm gonna take Salonia Cornuta and send her on a mission. That will give me one more loyalty from her. Not gonna make or break it, but you know, one more loyalty is one more loyalty. I think it's going to be, yeah, so our food, you know, surplus wharf in Rome uh, in Latium, right, negative one. So we're going to have her go to the province of uh, Latium as an emissary, and that'll give us plus four food. And hopefully that will have leveled her up. It did. So we are down to 18% chance risk of civil war, and it's minus 19 there. Remember, she got that bonus for running that mission. Uh, we actually can get Gnaeus Quincitius Imperius married, so we're going to marry him as get him married as well. Why not? It's going to cost us 460 denarii, but he now married Minucia Bestia. Reminds me of Bestia Talbot from uh, another Rome game that I play. And we're actually going to send her out on a mission as well. So both Magna Gratia and Cisalpina have food surpluses. So we're not going to send her there. We'll just have her organize games in Cisalpina for now because, you know, why not? That should level her up because that cost us like 1,100 denarii. Yep, she went to level 2. So it's still just plus 2 loyalty. But more importantly, it did get us to negative 10 loyalty now by having them go out and organize food and organize games so we're getting the bonus there remember that by organizing games and uh sending out the emissary that's plus five loyalty for the target party for five turns so that's it's a big deal it's a really big deal that's 10 loyalty we just picked up 
And then I will eventually pick up one more loyalty here from Minusia Bestia when she goes to rank 3. So looking pretty good. No one else can be promoted there. So the Gens Papyria, while not happy, right? They're still negative 10 loyalty. That's pretty good. So I'm, I'm happy. And I do want to get these guys as close to 0 as possible. Because like I said, I'm not sure what's going to happen when we keep those Scythian slaves out of the city. We might have some issues with the patricians. Like I said, the plebs will be fine because we did what the plebs wanted, but the patricians will likely be, at the very least, kind of angry. So we have Naeus Cornelius Scipio assigned, and he can actually be promoted, so we are going to promote him here. Currently, he's at rank 2, which is Quaestor. We're going to send him to an Aedilus. That'll gain us plus 4 to plus 6% tax rate, so we'll gain 2% tax rate, plus 1 to plus 2 Gravitas, so we're going to gain 1 Gravitas. Plus 2 to plus 3 loyalty for the political party, so that'll gain us 1 loyalty. Also will gain them plus 1 influence per turn for the ruling political party, faction-wide. He will have the abilities Inspire and Rally, which he also has, and he will have minus 40% temple construction costs for the local province. So, for 920 denarii, we promoted him, and uh, yeah. We can also send a new Unia Calva out on a mission. That will gain her, won't gain her any loyalty, but she is only rank one here. So we're going to go send her out, send as an emissary. We don't need her to go out as an emissary. I guess we can, we'll send her to Magna Gratia. It should give us, even though we're at plus nine food, it should give us a little bit more food there. It costs us about 1100 denarii, but does Magna Gratia now receive a food bonus? They do. So Organized Feast gets four food for any province. So that's it's nice to know that even if you're running a surplus, you do get bonus food there. Now that did strap us. We are down to 805 denarii. But we basically spent this entire turn just doing faction politics. We also dropped to barely known in the Senate. So that means we have to go here and gather support. And we are back to a 4% chance of civil war. That is because of the Gens Papyria uh, doing their thing. We are plus one in the Gens Cornelia though, and only minus four in the Gens Junia. I'm not sure what else I can really do here though. I think we're gonna have to stick at four percent because pretty much everyone went out of missions. Yeah, there's no real other way to get loyalty, so we're gonna have to hope that four percent is okay. And that handles our faction tab. Unfortunately, we went from that 6,000, I think, 600 denarii down to 368, so faction tab bankrupted us, like I said it will, but the good news is we have the Gens Cornelia at plus 1, the Gens Junia at minus 4, and the Gens Papyria at minus 12, and we could have secured the loyalty there for 1,100 denarii, that'll give us plus 10, but we don't have the money, and we retained our balanced influence in the Senate. So, faction tab looking good. Once again, there's not much I can do building-wise, because I have no money. Uh, yeah, there's not much I can do. I'm just waiting for buildings to complete. Nothing to do. Army-wise, we also can't really recruit anything either. Uh, we will move our armies around, though. So we have Legio 5, 1, and 4 up here. We're going to have Legio 4, Depart, 4, good old... Magna Gratia. So he can go all the way from just north of Aretium, past Rome, and just south of Rome. We're going to have him enter a patrol stance there. He still is missing those four Principes, so we might cannibalize them from Legio 3. We'll see. We don't have the money to recruit them. And then we're going to have Legio 1 here. It does have the one general and the four Principes, and we're going to have him head right on up to... Uh, we're going to station him right here. We're going to have him head right on up to past Genoa. And then have him close in back towards Genoa. And uh, enter a patrol stance for now. And then we're going to have Legio 5 head towards Ariminum. Right there, right on the border. And then put him into a patrol stance as well. So that leaves us with Legio 1 outside of Genoa. Legio 5 outside of Ariminum and Legio 4, just south of Roma, heading towards, the, you know, Sicily. And what's good here is we only have 
a couple Carthaginian units left to deal with. We are going to move Legio 3. I don't know if I want to move him further down south. Let's see what's going on here. So on Sicily, we have the Phoenician Wanderers. That's the enemy fleet led by Harmatus in the port. They're a 17 stack, so that fleet's actually pretty, pretty angry right now. And it looks like they're having more units join. So the ground war looks like it was a largely, you know, success on the defense, but they have a massive fleet here. We have the Will of Yam, right? That's another 11 stack Carthaginian fleet inside the port at Syracuse. And then we have the walls of Bursa in Syracuse proper. And they're a full 20 stack at full strength. They have a unit of elephants, a couple unit of sacred band hoplites, some regular hoplites, some regular cavalry, and then they have some mercenary forces there as well. So nothing too crazy. The unit or the city of Syracuse is regaining men though. So eventually when I have to fight the city of Syracuse currently held by Carthage, they're going to have a pretty large garrison. Now, I did find where that other fleet, or the other army went. It's the Pride of Mago. It's a fleet right now for some reason. I don't know why they took to the sea, but they did. So the Pride of Mago is here. It's led by Himilcar. He's just south of the tip of the Italian peninsula, right near the Straits of Messina. So I'm not sure if he's going to stay on the ocean or if he's going to try to land. But that leaves us with two 20-stack Carthaginian armies, one of them in Syracuse, one of them on the ocean, and then these two pretty beat up armies here in the south like i said they have melkart's justice has three units and the ambassador's atlas only have five units now legio 2 is in pretty good shape so i don't think i want them to move just yet because i don't know where these two enemy armies are going to go now just doing some quick math i think i can have legio 2 replenish from cosentia so Cosenti has 265 patricians and 421 Ready plebs left, and that should be just enough to get me, you know, get me completely reinforced. So I think what I am going to do is move Legio 2 out here, and let's see if him and Legio 3, so Legio 3 can move very far down south. They can get just south of Cosenti and still have some movement to spare. For more orders. For orders. Also what's nice is Legio 6 completely reinforced because they were in the city. And Cosenti is working on building their men back. They only lost about 25 swordsmen, 50 town guard, 150 citizens, and maybe a handful of slingers. So Cosentia's garrison is still looking good. I think we're going to try to have... Legio 2 destroy these two armies completely. So we're going to offer battle here and see what they do. Yeah, they did what I thought they would do. Both armies retreated. So do I want to try to destroy them or not? I think for now... Ready for orders. We pull back a little bit. I am going to stay in a much more offensive position here, though. And I'm going to have him enter a fortify position, as well as Legio 3, who's just behind him. Gonna have, he's not going to be in a fortified position, but he's going to stay right behind him. And we're going to have Legio's 2 and Legio's 3 here just kind of form up. And they are well south of Cosentia. I am almost at Regine here. Now, there is an enemy judge here. And there's another enemy judge, so those units could potentially cause some issues. But I do have a spy on Sicily, uh, an embedded veteran, and a dignitary that's still doing stuff. So hopefully I have enough defense against agent actions, but very, very good on the army part. So armies are all set for now. I think I'm going to take Legio 6 out of Cosentia, though, because I don't think Cosentia is in danger anymore, and I'm going to have him just patrol. That'll give me that little bit of extra income, right? Because all the income matters. Just to give you an idea of how badly we need income, we are down to 2,787 denarii per turn. So it is fairly ugly here. Looking up at Yadir, turning the taxes back on doesn't gain us much of anything, so we're not going to do that. Now, Hanno's Navigator, those Carthaginian pirates, are still raiding. They are raiding... Yeah, and it makes the waters contested. They are raiding in terrace pretty badly. 
And there is the Protectors of the Colonies there. That's that 14-stack Carthaginian Navy. Now, I do have a 12-stack Navy, but I'm not sure if I want to use that or not. I really would have liked to recruit a couple more units, but unfortunately, I cannot. So for now, we're going to send Class Assist 3. We're going to move it as far north as we can and still maintain out. I need to check. Can we go on a patrol stance? So it costs 50% of our movement to patrol. So as far north as we go, we do have to remain in a patrol stand or remain with half our movement. So we're going to move Class Assist 3 right outside of Riminum and enter that patrol stance. I'm going to move Class Assist 2 right up there as well. Put it in a patrol stance. And then we're going to put Class Assist 1 in the port at Ascalum. Try to get our guy there a little bit more experience because I'm pretty sure those two navies should be safe up there yeah I don't think anyone can reach them so they're safe and uh yeah I don't think there's many things we can give him we are gonna redo our uh, our households there because we got quite a few new ones so I do have this Palu Dementum which is really nice that's plus two authority and plus four percent morale the barley rations, they will give me that 4% morale as well. And uh, they'll give me one food in the local province, which is nice. But more importantly, I also have that minus 4% upkeep. So being a full stack, it would be nice. But I think I'm going to stay with the Palu Dementum. We're going to go ahead and give that extra barley rations to Legio 3 here, Aeneas Cornelius Scipio. Now, yes, it's not going to be the biggest thing because he's not a full 20 stack yet. But eventually, he will be a full 20 stack because Legio 4... Is on the way down to give him some more units. And then we did have a diligent centurion here. That's public order, but we don't really need public order. We are going to give public order people to Lucius Cornelius Scipio. He's not going to do much more fighting right now, but he is going to be kind of as a, you know, holding force. So we're going to go ahead and give him some units here to help him out. Nothing too crazy. And then I'm not sure what Zeal does in a navy, but we did get a Dread Cultist, so it'd be nice to... Now the Dread Cultist takes up the shipwright spot, so we're definitely not going to do that. We're going to go ahead and give our uh, Admiral here, though, Quintus Triple A Strabo, a Carrier Pigeon. Maybe that'll give him a little extra line of sight and help him out. And then... Uh... Yeah, that's it. That pretty much takes care of our armies and navies for now. So armies and navies are in good shape. We're up to 3,106 denarii per turn. So despite me kind of panicking over the lack of money, you know, it's not bad. We only lost 200 from last turn, and we recruited three ships. So to be honest, that's, that's not bad. I will have to focus on the navy, though. I really do need to get more ships, because right now these Carthaginians and these... Carthaginian pirates are threatening and you know with this almost 20 stack fleet out here it's gonna have to fight it at some point but looks like we're just gonna focus on good old Sicily for now so we're right there at Regium we might actually cross into Sicily and try to use that raiding stance with two armies there once we have two full stack legions I'm confident we can take Sicily so we might even redeploy Legio 4 back up north and, uh, yeah, see what we can do. Anyways, for now, let's go ahead and check our diplomacy tab, right? We did have a lot of things happen here. So if you recall, we are at war with the Arabian pirates, the Ossetani, Carthage, Lugos, Editani, and the Carthaginian pirates. Um, Sali here remains at war with the Ossetani, and they are also at war with the Vivisi now, an undiscovered faction. I don't know where the Vivisi are, so I'm not going to quite declare a war on them just yet. Uh, the Venetians are just at war with the Lugos. So again, I don't really have any vision on the Lugos, and I can't afford... Oh, I do. Here's the Lugos. The Lugos are actually pretty strong. They look like they're actually stronger than the Venetians. So the Lugos threaten me too far. I might have to go on down and head up north with a full army. I do have two armies in the north, but they're not full stacks. They're just a six stack outside of Genoa and a... Uh, three stack outside of Ariminum. 
Uh, Antigone and I are still on three cities, so that's good. They're still at war with Athens and Epirus. Epirus being at war with the Antigone and Carthage. Uh, I am stronger than Epirus now, which is good, but I'm still focusing on Carthage. With that defeat, though, Carthage's balance of power didn't change as much as I thought it would. You know, I thought we'd be closer to a third now. I mean, we, we got closer, but I still think it's between a quarter and a third. So it's interesting that with the destruction of almost, I'm going to say, 32 units, right? And the loss of, what was it, 6,600 men. Yeah, I expected more damage to be done, but what are you going to do? As for that, there's no one really else to talk to. So, diplomatic map is done. Campaign map, we handled the... Uh, theater here in Sicily and Magna Graecia. Like I said, Alalia is still wide open, so I'm reconsidering that attack. And then in the Massalian Theater, nothing's really happening. So, theaters of war look pretty quiet. I am concerned, though, about the Mare Adriticum, and like I said, the Mare Adriticum is shared right now, so it's quiet, but the Mare Ionium is contested. So, minus 39% from wealth is definitely hurting the province of Magna Graecia. So yeah, I think that about covers it. Um, we'll do a quick little culture and order roundup and then head on to the next turn here. So Genoa, up there in Cisalpina, it's doing good. They're at 48 public order with plus 13 next turn, 32.7% Latin, losing 0.1% next turn, and they're making 783 denarii with Legio 1 patrolling outside of the city. We have Roma and Latium, 100 public order, plus four next turn. They are 65.1% Latin with a 0.7% move next turn. They are making 13,703 denarii. Magna Gratia, right, that's Terrace. We have 100 public order with plus 14 next turn. We are 63.9% Latin with a 0.4% move next turn, making 4,160 denarii. Iadir, minus 63 with a plus one move next turn, and the taxes are off, so there's no income being made. 3.6% Latin with a 1.7% move next turn. And that'll just about do it for us. So we're going to go ahead and kind of focus here on... Yeah, we'll focus on Sicily and uh, Magna Graecia and end the turn. So we have 368 denarii in the treasury. We're set to make 3,106 next turn. Not good, but we have this huge military buildup, so it's to be expected. And we have 24 food. So with that, let's wave farewell to turn 39, summer of 269 BCE. Let's see what Carthage does now. What moves are you going to make, Carthage? You sail up and attack those Carthaginian pirates, who are now outside of Epidamnos. They're thinking, what else do they want to do? I guess that's going to be it. No, nope, they decided to move their navy. Oop, they moved an army and they moved a navy. So that giant navy is now heading to the Marionium, as well as that army. And that's it. Carthage didn't do much. So this is actually really good right now. Like, really good. I do have an inkling what I want to do now, though. And I think it's going to be pretty awesome. Once again, the lack of a navy scares me, though. So, to reorder our priorities, first order of business is going to be get a navy. Like a 20-stack navy. Because, yeah, we're going to need it. And then after we get that 20-stack navy, we're going to hope and pray. That's where we're at right now, hoping and praying. But... We'll talk about it more when it gets to our turn. I am going to do the spotlight here, though, because I do want to kind of fit that in. It's going to be a short spotlight. I know I said that the Roman military reforms and whatnot would be a bit longer, but I realized that if I did all of them, I would be here for an hour. So we're going to do just the Roman army and reforms in the Regal era, right? That's during the Roman kingdom or the king's period. And then we'll get to the Camillan and Polybian right, the Republican era next time. All right, so welcome to turn 40. 
it is fall of 269 BCE. Salonia Cornuta has returned from her mission. Minucia Bestia has returned from her mission. Eunia Calva has returned from hers. Marcus Cluilius Mergus, the veteran, has gained a level. And Sextus Antonius Dento, the veteran, have gained a level, so they leveled up as I thought. A child is born, Calia Calva. So I guess that's another girl. And then we have reached the Polybian military reforms. The wars of the past decades and our continual bouts with Italian forces have somehow proven fruitful, as the influence of Aroma grows beyond its humble Italian origins. Our councils have perfected manipular tactics, the old hoplite phalanx replaced by three lines of maniples sorted by age and experience instead of class and wealth. The young Hastati, backed up by the older, more heavily armed Principes, followed by the veteran Triarii in reserve. Our military has also adopted some of the armaments and armor of our enemies, their utility proven by mercenaries of the Poenae and warriors of the Celtae. Our soldiers now carry Pila, javelins, and Hastate and Principes both have replaced their Hasta, those are spears, with deadly short swords we call the Gladius. The older Triarii, reluctant to change, still fight as a hoplite phalanx. Ascensii and levies are no longer used, while Velites become the chosen skirmisher unit. New reforms usually open up new equipment and new ways of combat. Not necessarily stronger overall, but usually more efficient for the time and for the challenges presented ahead. Some reforms can require a period of adaptation to new tactics. Study well the differences in your troops, because this can mean the difference between victory and defeat. Then Ulpia Several, Sevra. Ulpia Sevra has also gained a level, and Marcus Claudius Marcellus, the governor, has gained a level. So much has happened. Now, our conflict of the orders has resolved. The throng of plebs cheers as the patricians takes the Scythians away from the city. Your informants warn you that after returning, the insulted slave owner has begun plotting his vengeance in secret. So that is not good. That is very not good. So I thought we might have a minor penalty with the patricians. Conniving patricians. We've lost the support of the noble families of Rome. We are alone in this. So for eight turns, we have minus 4% tax rate, plus 6% empire maintenance, and worst of all, minus 16 loyalty for all political parties. Ouch. Risk of civil war is going to be high, and we only have 3,521 denarii right now. I'm not happy. Happy plebs. The plebs are high in spirit for some reason, plus 10% wealth from agriculture in all regions, plus 10% wealth from industry in all regions, and plus 4 public per turn in all provinces. That's for 8 turns. So, while we let those slew of things digest, let's do the spotlight real quick. Maybe my brain can process that as I talk. So, the Roman army and reforms in the Regal Era. Early Rome, or known as the Roman King, right, the Roman Kingdom period, took place from 753 to 509 BCE, right? That's when Rome was ruled by kings. This was the first reform period of the Roman army, and the era was called the Early Regal Era. Regal, obviously, meaning king. We know that when the city-state of Rome was threatened, clan or region-based units would form up for defense. So remember, you had the seven hills of Rome. They were defended, right? So basically, that's seven clans or seven families or region-based units. This was only under external threat, right? When Rome was under a severe external threat. The majority of the combat was, in fact, clan-based. So you had hilltop clans, right? These hilltop clans, such as the Fabii, they would form a war band and raid maybe a neighboring tribe. Not a Roman tribe, right? They would name, like, other nearby Latin or perhaps Italic peoples they would raid. This was very similar to either Celtic or Barbarian fighting styles. Remember, war bands was a very barbarian thing. Now, it wasn't until about 550 BCE until about 500 BCE that the Roman army began to coalesce into the larger unit that we know today. And this time period was known as the Late Regal Era. So, it started off with a mass levy being ordered on eligible adult male citizens. And the critical change here was the adoption of heavy armor and the use of Greek-style equipment. The influence of the Greeks to the south, south likely influenced this change in Rome's military. Plate armor was introduced to protect vital areas of the body, and the Roman military began to fight in a more hoplite-style phalanx rather than a warband 
style barbarian raid format. The Romans continued to restructure their military. They always sought to adapt to the situation and overcome adversity, and this willingness to adapt could be attributed to why they were so successful. So during the late regal period, also known as the Servian period because it was the Servian king that said it, Rome would levy around 9,000 men at the start of the campaign season. These 9,000 men who were levied consisted of around 6,000 heavy hoplite-style infantry, 2,400 light infantry, and then later these infantry would become kind of like skirmishers, so they weren't necessarily engaged in combat, but they would screen the main Roman heavy infantry that was moving, and 600 salaries, later to be known as equites, salaries meaning fast movers. Now, the heavy infantry were made up of land-owning males, the light infantry of landless and poorer males, and the cavalry, the patricians of Rome. So, that kind of makes sense in how things are recruited here, but the idea being that Early on, Rome used a warband style family raiding skirmishing unit type, and then eventually they grew into that more formal 9,000 men levied every campaign season. So in the spring, where you had the heavy infantry as your backbone, your light infantry as a skirmishing force, and your cavalry as a harassing force. And there you go. That pretty much covers the regal period, right? The early regal period and the late regal period. After that, we will see significant reforms once the yoke of the kings is thrown off. It is interesting because the last king of Rome, right? I believe that's uh, Lucius Superbus Tarquinius. He will join forces with a lot of the Latin allies around Rome, and he will try to march back into Rome and take the city. And under the fledgling republic, you know, he will be defeated. And a lot of those nearby Latin and Italic states will be forced to be on equal terms with Rome. That was the Latin League and the first of what would be known as the Latin Wars, which last for on and off again about 75 years. So, with our spotlight covered, let's head into turn 40, fall of 269 BCE, and check out our event messages. So we have a motivated populace in Cisalpina, Motivated populace being that plus 4% tax rate and plus 3 growth per turn. Very good. Household expands. Lucius Cornelius Scipio, right? We gave him the barley. So he now has... Actually, no. That's a new one. We gave Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio the barley. So we have an extra barley here. Did he equip it? He did not. So we can give that barley on over to Lucius Papyrus Cursor. Although we're going to move those armies around, so not just yet. Assassination attempt. Ayabal. The target was Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Asina. The action was assassinate. The enemy has failed to assassinate one of your own servants, but they will undoubtedly try again. So that is interesting. One of the enemy decided to try to assassinate one of my people. I don't like that. The faction destroyed the Hayek. So this is when we had our three lovely ladies return from their missions, and we had our increase in ranks. So we're going to go ahead to our veterans here and see what we want to do. So we're going to take Marcus Cluilius Mergus. We're going to upgrade his Pancreaton Master. Remember, I am Hercules Reborn. I'm going to go from plus 5 to plus 10 unit experience gained per turn in the army. Plus 3% chance to plus 6% chance of a successful assassination. Minus 2 to minus 4% upkeep for all land units in the parent army. And then plus 2 to plus 4 bread... Uh, public order in the bread and games edict so that'll give us a little bit of income bump there but nothing huge now this is where it gets interesting do we want to recruit or do we want to not recruit but do we want to go into new stuff or upgrade our old stuff and we're going to go into a couple new stuff here so we're going to go into the skill militancy sometimes aggression is the only open path plus five percent campaign map movement range I told you how important that is plus five unit experience gained per turn for the parent army also critical important, and minus 5% chance of anticipating an enemy ambush parent army. So we're going to go ahead and take that skill, and then we're going to see what else we can go into here. So we went into Valor before. Paragon is not, not Paragon, single combat master really isn't too important, so we don't need that. There's not too much left here that I really want to get into. So for now... We're actually going to go ahead. We have three potential skill slots left available. 
but I don't think we're going to use them for now. We're just going to upgrade some of our base stuff. So we're going to upgrade Paragon, right? So we're going to go from plus one authority to plus two, minus eight to minus 10% cost of performing all enemy actions, and plus five to plus 10% chance of critical success in all actions. That's mainly for the one extra authority, right? And then we are going to level up probably... Well, no, that's it. We're all out of a point. So that was our three points. So we're done. And then we'll go over to... Uh, let's see who else leveled up here. Our other veteran here. Uh, what's his name? Sextus Antonius Dento. So he had Athlete, right? My strength is legendary, plus 5% campaign map movement range. It's going to go to plus 10% campaign map movement range. Plus 5 to plus 10 unit experience gained per turn in the parent army. Minus 2 to minus 4% upkeep for all land units. And plus 2 to plus 4 public order. So very, very similar to Pankration Master, which makes sense because Pankration was a form of wrestling. Then we're going to go into Militancy. We talked about that before. And then we're going to go ahead and upgrade Paragon for the extra authority. So very similar movements there. Remember, we did have a child that was born. You just saw Risk of Civil War 53%, so I'm about to cry. But we do have Kalia Calva was born now. So we have Amelia Regula, our oldest daughter, died at the age of two. But Furia Scapula is now five, so she's doing well. Aulus Julius Veteris is now two, so he looks like he's doing well. And Kalia Calva is zero, so she was just born. We will return to that faction tab, though, later, where we will cry about the chance of civil war being so high. We also talked about our Polybian military reforms, which we'll get to probably in our next episode. I'll probably do Polybian military reforms on Monday with the Camillan reforms, and then we'll return to our Punic Wars on the Wednesday and Friday episodes. Opia Severa has also gained a rank, so we are going to go into infiltration. Not all doors need keys plus 5 line of sight, which is cunning based, and plus 5% chance of successfully launching an ambush in the local region while deployed. We did that primarily for the line of sight, and then I don't think there's anything else we really want to take here. I am kind of looking, though, and I think it's going to be, actually, we're going to look at t going into... Mm, I don't know, nothing. So we're just going to go ahead and give her some stat points here. We are going to go into, uh, remember she's a brothel worker, so plus 2 to plus 4% chance of success in actions against enemy agents and generals, plus 5 to plus 10% cost of performing all actions, and plus 2 to plus 4 public order per turn in the local province. And then we're going to give her one extra point into uh, spy. So she's going to go from plus 1 to plus 2 cunning, and plus 5 to plus 10% chance of evading enemy agents. And that just gives her a little bit more line of sight. Hopefully helps us see what's going on. And then I think our last guy that leveled up was Marcus Claudius Marcellus up here. And we're going to go ahead and go into Magnate level 2. Plus, or yeah, plus. Minus 3 to minus 6% construction costs in the local province. And then plus 6 to plus 12% commercial stimulation edict. Not really being used just yet, but we can move him around eventually. And then we're going to go into Paragon. Uh, plus five percent research rate and plus two public order per turn. We've discussed that before. A learned man will always have the people's best interests at heart. And then lastly, I think we're gonna go into. Mm, I think we'll go into the second level of bureaucrat. Minus five to mind and ten percent construction costs, and then plus five to plus ten percent tax rate in local province while deployed. And that pretty much handles. All of our uh, all of our increases in uh, rank. Uh, neither of our spies are going to be moved, so we're going to kind of just leave Olpia Sever where she is, as we need vision. And same with Mamemia and Hanno Barbara outside of Alalia. And then our governors, I think, are still administrating. We're just going to double check here that they didn't get popped out of that administration stance, which they didn't. Covered our veterans, right? They leveled up. Now to our faction tab. And this is where things are very ugly. We have a 53% chance of civil war, and everyone is disloyal. So we do have 3,521 denarii in the treasury, which means we are going to buy off each and every political party here. So the Gens Junia, we're going to secure the loyalty. They're going to go from minus 20 to minus 5, I believe. No, nope, minus 20 to minus 10. 
loyalty. And then against Papyria, we go from minus 28 to minus 18. That dropped us to 24%. And then against Cornelia, minus 15. Nope, we can't secure them. We're already secured. So they're going to stay at minus 15. So we're at minus 18 and against Papyria, minus 15 and against Cornelia, and minus 10 and against Junia for still a massive 24% chance of civil war. Now, if you do recall, going back to our handy dandy tactical map here, the Gens Cornelia does control all of Magna Gratia. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the ripcord, right? That's me panicking. And we're going to go from commercial stimulation in Magna Gratia to party loyalty. So it's not going to take place this turn, but the Gens Cornelia will go from minus 15 to zero loyalty next turn. So that'll be good. I don't know if minus 10 is currently contributing to that risk of civil war. I know minus 18 definitely is, but I'm not sure what I can honestly do in the Gens Papyria. I guess I can have one of our women go on missions here. So Minucia Bestia is still only a rank 2, so going to rank 3 she will gain one loyalty. So I guess we'll just have her organize games in Illyricum. Right, it'll cost us a whole bunch of money here. 1,196 will just about bankrupt us, but we need to do it anyways because Illyricum needs public order. Right, you're looking at Illyricum right now. We'll just scroll over real quick before we send it. Illyricum is negative 62 with a negative 9 move next turn, so that organized games has to be done regardless. So we're going to go ahead and send it. We leaves us one, yeah, 1,000. leaves us 117 denarii in the treasury. And our chance of civil war is now down to 13%, so much more reasonable. I think once the Gens Cornelia gains control of Magna Gratia, we'll have a 0% chance of civil war, but man, 53% chance of civil war with 3,000 denarii, definitely pulling the ripcord for sure. That is panic central. So, event messages handled, right? Our agents are successfully handled, factions handled, can't build any more buildings, right? They're uh, very poor. Not that there's any buildings currently being built in Genoa slash Cisalpina. We got two turns left on the trading port in Ascalum, one turn on the aqueduct in Magna Grecia, three on the olive oil factory in the Allied State, and two turns on the marble outcrop and the consecrated ground. So a couple turns left before we're going to have to turn that public order or turn the taxes back on the Yadder. We just we need the money. 4,371 isn't good, and worst of all, we took all that money that we were going to spend on our navy, and we put it into faction politics, so our navy continues to remain in a sad, sad state. We are going to move Classicus 3 as far north as we can here. Like I said, I'm worried. We have these Carthaginian and these uh, other navies here. So Carthage, like I said, they're far enough south that I think I'm okay, but we're going to move Classicus 3 just north here outside of Ariminum, and we're going to have Classicus 3 patrol. We'll move Classicus 2 outside of Iadar and have them patrol up there. They still should both be out of range of any potential Carthaginian or pirate actions, so that's safe, but like I said, Classicus 1 is still in a little bit of trouble here. 12, 12 ships is not enough to defend against uh, 14 stack, or more importantly, the 20 stack that is now headed my way so with our fleet actions handled we are going to move legio 5 a little bit further south just going to have it be in reinforcement range of ariminum in case we get attacked have them patrol the region legio 1 will stay up there in a patrol stance we are moving legio 4 as far south as possible he will not get nearly as far as i want so he will only reach the south of Beneventum, so we're going to put him back in that patrol stance, and then we're actually going to withdraw Legio 3 here, because we have the Pride of Mago, that is the army that is kind of approaching the heel of Italy, right, the boot, so we're going to move Legio 3 as far north as we can, and then we're going to move uh, Legio 2 back up to just south of Cosentia. Have him enter a fortify stance. Uh, Legio 2, or Legio 3, we are not, right? That's Legio 3 led by Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio. We are not going to have him enter a 
patrol region stance just because I'm not sure where the enemy is going to land. And we're going to put Legio 6 back in the city, led by Lucius Cornelius Scipio. So once again, we're adopting a more defensive posture here. That did drop our income from about 4,400 to 3,700 denarii. That 3,700 being a pretty large increase from last turn, but like I said, it's still dangerous here just because we have the Pride of Mago, and I don't know where they're going. I don't know where they're going to try to land and attack. So they currently can't attack Taros, which is good, but this is kind of just going to be a turn where we just take a moment, pump the brakes, and adopt a more defensive posture before we can get all three of these legions ready to go, right? Legio 2, led by Lucius Julius Libo, still just south of Cosentia. Legio 4, led by Lucius Papyrus Cursor, he's patrolling and on his way down south. And Legio 3, led by Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio, just hanging out, I'm not going to have him patrol, because in the event that an enemy army does land, I do not want him to get ambushed. And that pretty much handles that. We do have, uh, like I said, the walls of Bursa are still in Syracuse, with the Will of Yam in the port. And then you have the Ambassadors of Atlas and Melkart's Justice, both in four to five positions. One on the tip of Italy, right, in the Regium area, where the city of Regium would be. And then one on northeastern Sicily, where Messina would be. Like I said, that covers our armies and navies. And that kind of covers our campaign map uh, review here. Just checking out the Massalian Theater. Nothing has changed. Just hanging out, looking at the Venetian theater. All the cities I can see are empty. Uh, there is, like I said, the Carthaginian pirates here raiding Epidamnos. And you have the Titanes here, an 18 stack led by Tele Telesphoros. So they might set to sea and do something. Uh, in a turn of events, Larissa was taken by Athens. So we have the Antigonae down on the two cities now. They might be suffering pretty heavily. Just taking a look here, the Antigonidae are suffering. So Athen the, the Athenians and Epiros ganging up on them definitely, definitely hurts. So, yeah. Uh, I think that's going to be it. We're going to end the turn here because, you know, we've gone a pretty, pretty good amount of time in. And, uh, yeah, I don't really want to get into what's going to happen next time. So we're going to go ahead and focus our map here kind of on uh, we don't really care about Sicily right now we're more worried about these Carthaginian navies and uh, armies moving about so we'll focus on up right about here and uh, call it so once again thanks everyone for tuning in I appreciate the support and I hope you all enjoyed this episode I will see you next time and uh, have a good one see ya